Hi, welcome to Mailbag Monday, everyone's favourite segment. Yes, I'm using the new bench this time. I thought I'd change it up, uh, experiment with the mailbag a bit where I actually open them on camera here on the bench in front of me. Uh, I'll give it a go. Let me know if you don't like it. Let me know if you prefer the uh, previous format. I'll just open them here and then I'll cut to the other bench where I actually do my existing shot and uh, play with the item once I've taken it out of the packet so you can see my reaction when I open it. That's the whole idea. Anyway, let me know. Yes, I have changed a bit of the background. I've got a bit more instrument porn behind me. So let's get right into it. And for those who've been watching on EEV Blog 2, where I did a couple of tests with uh, exposure and this setup, I'm actually using my uh, Rode VideoMic Pro shotgun mic instead of my uh, wireless lapel mic that I'd normally do for a like a two meter distance away from the camera. So uh, that seems to be working quite well in this position. Anyway, uh, I've now got 10 items to open. Not sure if I'll get through them all on today's mailbag, but let's give it a go. This one is from Mark Richards, and he's from Sylvania in Ohio, where Chris Gamble is from. Everyone's from bloody Ohio these days. Jeez, fellow blogger Martin Lawton's there. And uh, seems that every man and his dog is uh, moving there, although I've heard Rigol are moving out of Ohio. So there you go. Um, so thank you very much, Mark. Let's have a look here. I know what's in it. Good thing about this is that I don't have to like hide all the uh, address anymore. There's something in there. Don't want to throw it out. This is the DigiKey uh, recycled uh, package in its course. We've look, we looked at that before. This is great. I can just throw it off the front of the bench. Oh, how efficient. I like efficiency. Anyway, we've got some... Oh, it's a 3D printed stand and it's a bat symbol. Ta -da! Hang on. Got to be something else in here, I reckon. Yep, there is. There's a couple of little boards. Let's go to the other bench. First up, he's included a bat symbol here for uh, Sagan cut out of red oak, and it's 24 karat gilded edges on it, and a three with a 3D printed stand here. So that is pretty neat. Thank you very much. By the way, how do you gild edges like that? I'm not into. Uh, doing that sort of thing, please let me know. But the major thing he sent in here is what he calls a power or, or power or board. Get it? Power or? Power? Love it. Anyway, um, it's a dual input uh, power supply that switches, basically switches between different uh, input, two different inputs, and you can set a threshold voltage with this uh, pot here, and then it automatically transitions between two different power sources. Like you could have, say, a battery power source and a mains power source, and it'll the uh, Texas Instruments chip in here will automatically switch. There it is. Uh, will automatically switch between both inputs. Um, when you get to a certain threshold, it'll seamlessly, so it'll continue to power your product. Uh, for example, when the mains fails, it'll automatically switch over to battery, or vice versa, or you could have it uh, solar powered, something solar powered, for example, then it would switch over to battery. And it's quite a comprehensive list of uh, functions here, set by various uh, jumpers and pads on the uh, bottom of the board down in here, and it can various uh, configurations. I won't bore you with all the details, but uh, it's rather interesting. Designed it for a microcontroller, Raspberry Pi, and other low voltage projects and uh, stuff like that. Now, Mark wants me to critique the design. All right. Let's go. And by the way, Mark is a beginner, and uh, yes, this is one of his first uh, projects, so I'll go easy on him. But uh, anyway, one of the first things I noticed is that, well, the pot is one of these huge ones like this. Eas these things are easily bumped. You know, you accidentally sort of, you know, brush it or move it about, throw it about the place. I wouldn't have used that. Uh, trimmer there as a set point for something like this. I would have uh, used, you know, like at least a flat one that you need to get like a screwdriver in there to actually turn it. Anything that can be turned by hand, nah, bad idea. Now I can understand why you did this uh, two board arrangement here. It's actually designed to be breadboard friendly, 
so that uh, it plugs in. And yes, I have checked it. You did get the uh, pin, pitch, and everything correct. So thumbs up there. No problems whatsoever. So it does plug into a breadboard. And then if you want to use it for, say, a Raspberry Pi, then you just plug it into this shield at the bottom. And of course, the standard micro, the existing micro USB input here, you can have a secondary input coming in over here. And then you've got, of course, the USB output, which then goes off to your Raspberry Pi or other USB power product. And it can, then it can automatically select between the USB or some other uh, wired in power source. But the other big issue that is immediately obvious is that the symmetrical pin layout, I can take this off, rotate it and put it in backwards. So unless you've been very clever and actually wired it, uh, set the pin out so that it doesn't matter which way it goes in, then wah, that's a bad move there. You even need to stagger uh, the pins or you know plug up one of the holes or do something so you, you can't plug it in the wrong way around. And the next thing is the solder in. So you haven't used nearly enough solder there. I do applaud your use of minimalist uh, solder. Too much solder looks really ugly, but uh, you really haven't used enough there at all. Uh, always use uh, fine solder, of course. I believe you have been using fine solder, like I use, you know, 0.4 or 0.35 millimeter diameter uh, solder really thin stuff but then feed it on there until the until you get a nice fillet on all of those joints on the positive side there's nothing wrong with your uh, hand soldered smd stuff there good work and as far as your uh, jump your solder jumpers on the back here i i like solder jumpers of course it looks like you got the pad in the middle and you're just bridging this side here but what is l and what is p when i dig this out of my uh, you know, junk box to go use the thing, then I don't want to have to go back and read the documentation to figure out what that means. You've got plenty of silk screen space in there to put, you know, at least a complete word, a complete description. And the other good thing is that on your layout here, you have got solder mask between your individual pads in there. That's a big, big uh, beginner mistake. A lot of beginners just, the solder mask expansion is too big and they don't have any solder mask between there or it's so very thin that the manufacturers can't uh, actually manufacture it uh, properly. And then you can get uh, solder bridges and stuff between there. So excellent work on the uh, solder mask expansion there. Now I do like the fact also that you've put the manual set resistors underneath the pot. Uh, you can't uh, see it here, but uh, Mark has told me that he's done that. I can see it on the PCB uh, layout uh, overlay as well. So if you remove the pot, then there's two footprints under there for two uh, set resistors. So you can manually set and do away with the pot. So that's neat. I guess if you really wanted to, you could have squeezed out maybe an extra uh, row in there and put these pins here and just had some of the resistors on the back, uh, for example. But uh, uh, anyway, like you've decided to top populate it. I probably would have maybe populated all the parts on the bottom because you've got all room in there. You've got that height there available for all your SMD parts. So it kind of makes sense to put all your SMD parts on that side. Don't worry about calling the board the top or the bottom or, or whatever. It's, you know, it makes no difference. As long as you've got all your parts on one side, then you could have a through hole part on the other side, for example. And that's how you can get really tiny footprints. So I think it could have even, it's quite small now, but I think you could have even made that one smaller. Like you could have put the chip and all the other capacitors and resistors underneath this pot and then maybe moved this one row over and maybe even moved that one row over and just squeezed in the pot right on top. That would have been neat. And my other complaint has absolutely nothing to do with the board or the uh, design whatsoever. It has to do with the fact that you haven't provided me with a schematic to look at. And also I went to the website, which I love the name, Mouse Bite Fever, um, on GitHub, and there are no PDF schematic files available for easy viewing. You've only got the Eagle board and uh, schematic files, and I don't have Eagle in my system. I'm not going to install Eagle just to view a schematic. So uh, that's just a note to everyone who's doing open source hardware projects like this. There was actually a thread on the forum about this. Somebody complained about it or, or one of the threads just went a bit uh, burko on this exact uh, topic. Not providing a schematic in a you know an easily viewable PDF format. And I think that's pretty essential. And you know if you're going to go to the effort to do and release an open source hardware product, just 
you know, make the schematic easily viewable. Not everyone has Eagle or whatever on their system. And for those who haven't seen inside uh, this chip before, they are quite neat. They're not a voltage regulator or anything like that. They're basically just a dual switch to automatically switch between the two inputs here. And uh, that's exactly what we're doing too. Uh, power MOSFETs in there, not huge power of course. It's only uh, this particular device is only designed for low power stuff. But I noticed on Mark's GitHub that he's done another design which uses an external MOSFET which uh, allows for higher voltages and higher currents. Anyway, two internal MOSFETs which are just basically switched off and on, but it allows some extra functionality. It's got a current limiter just here set by an external resistor and I don't no, Mark didn't mention anything about the current uh, limiting, so that's probably one extra thing I would have uh, done on here, maybe if you had room, I'd at least put a uh, footprint for the current limiting resistor, I'd maybe even if you had room, maybe not on this design, but if you did, I'd have like a couple of uh, dip switches on there, maybe a little uh, two or a four way dip switch or something like that with four different value resistors, and the user can just like choose four different two, or even just two different uh, current limit settings, that would uh, that would be nice. Anyway, it's got built-in thermal cutout and all sorts of stuff like that. And uh, really quite nice dedicated chip for switching between two input sources here. And dead easy to use. I mean, you basically feed the voltage in, you just decouple it. Feed the voltage out, you might have to decouple the output. And, but uh, not much else. Bob's your uncle. And as far as the PCB layout goes, I don't uh, mind it at all. Oh, you've got some right angles there. The electrons are just going to fall off the corner. <coughs> Jeez, some people take that seriously. Unbelievable. But uh, yeah, we can basically switch between the top and the bottom there. Oh, look at that. Neat. And uh, uh, something that I immediately always look for on designs like this is, well, do you have enough uh, via stitching in here to get your ground coupling over? Because your current is not uh, flowing through here at all. It just stops. That's just some flood fill. So you have flood fill. This is not bad. And uh, But basically, you've got... Um, your ground coming across here, going through up through one via there and jumping across to another via down in there. So, you know, as a general rule of thumb, one via good enough for, you know, half an amp, something like that. So on this design, which is designed for uh, low current applications, yeah, it's going to be good enough. Just as a matter of course, maybe I would have thrown in an extra via, but probably not on this design. So that's fine. Um, and yeah. Not a real issue, but as I said, I would have just mounted all of the parts on the bottom, SMD parts on the bottom, underneath the through-hole trim pot, and then uh, uh, did it that way. So you still get the advantage of being able to mass manufacture this thing, because your components are only, well, mass manufacturing, you still manufacture it when it's, whether either it's single-sided or double-sided component loaded, but the fact is it only has to go through one pass in the SMD machine if you were mass manufacturing this, uh, which isn't the case, but if you were, then uh, good practice dic dictates you put all the parts on one side and the through hole part, well, they would just hand solder those anyway. So, and that's a potential way you could have maybe, you know, made the board, you know, that wide or something like that, perhaps, at a guess, I don't know. I haven't done the actual um, measurements and things like that, but hey, that is a good first effort for an electronics beginner. I like that. Good on you, Mark. Thanks for sending that one in. And if you want to check out his project, it's github.com mousebite fever. Staying alive, staying alive. Ah, 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 staying alive. Next up, we have one from the old Dart. Yes, England. And uh, this one comes from Mr. Damien Nagel. Good on you, Damien. And uh, let's crack this sucker open and see what we've got inside. Aha! I'm liking the look of this. I'm liking the look. Here we go. Oh, -ho! go away. Yes. Casio FX 7000 GB. Awesome. GB. Great Britain. Hey, beauty. Unbelievable. Damien went and married a bloody pom. Un <laughs> he's actually an Aussie and he married a pom and that's why he's over there. But he's back now, apparently. He has returned. Anyway, um, he this is what he actually paid for it. £2.50. P. 
awesome in a thrift shop. Unbelievable. I always wanted one of these babies, the FX7000. I lusted after this. I never had this one. And, uh, oh, it's just awesome. Look, you can get a sine wave. Oh, and this is pre-VPAM rubbish too, I think. So, yeah, beauty. I, I hate VPAM. VPAM's stupid. And there's a nice postcard of the Clifton Suspension Bridge. I haven't seen that one, but uh, I have been over the world's longest suspension bridge, which, or second longest or whatever, it was the world's longest at one point, and that was in, uh, that's the Humber Bridge. I can't believe what, uh, I can't remember what uh, town it was in, but it was um, on the east coast south of Bridlington where I uh, stayed for a couple of weeks. So it was like, yeah, like half an hour's drive uh, from there. And then we have um, Bristol. Awesome. I have not been to Bristol. That looks very nice. I'd love to go back to England. It'd be fantastic. There we go. Somerset and Avon, the Briston, Bristol Channel. Terrific. Haven't been there. I've been to Bath, which is around here somewhere, I think. Yeah, that's right. Bath is like out here somewhere southeast of Bristol, so slightly off the map. Anyway, I maybe we sort of scooted through the outskirts of Bristol. I can't exactly recall, but yeah, anyway, been to Bath. Loved Bath. Fantastic. Wow, there it is. Check that out. That's in really good nick. I love that. That is fantastic. It needs some batteries, apparently. It doesn't work. Um, but, uh, yeah, made in Japan. Um, CR 2032, three of them. No worries. I can get that sucker powered up. No problems whatsoever. And as far as um, keyboard, uh, key layout goes, not bad. Dedicated engineering button, that's what you need. Dedicated inverse button, that's what you need as well. And it uh, doesn't have a dedicated XY swap button. No, that's a bit of a bummer. But uh, it doesn't have a, it's got dedicated squared button, which is excellent. Um, but yeah, shame it doesn't have a register swap dedicated key unless I'm missing it. Actually, this is rather interesting that it's only got two screws on one side here and then has the uh, tabs on the other side. So that's rather unusual. There you go. Notes on battery replacement. Switch power off, blah, 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 blah. Let's whack some batteries in. That's a rather uh, unusual battery compartment. Just goes in there and just slides in and just hooks under there like that. It's actually rather effective. I like that. All right, let's see if we can power this relic up. It's not that old. Oh, there we go. We have to seriously uh, do some contrast uh, there on the screen, but there we go. We're in like Flynn. Yeah, it's certainly not the best display there. Look at that. You know, you turned up decent contrast and then, then you get all the uh, stuff on the back there. So it's not it's not terrific screen, that's for sure, but that's what you get with dot matrixes of that era, really. According to Wikipedia, this was the world's first graphene scientific calculator back released back in 1985. Oh, you know what else happened in 1985? Yeah. When this baby hits 88 miles an hour, you're going to see some serious shit. Oh no! Damn it! I was wrong! Even though it's not, it doesn't use VPAM, visually perfect algebraic method, it uses true algebraic mode. So basically what that means is if you enter like, you know, 10, you can't just go in there and hit sign like that. It doesn't work. It gives you a syntax error. You've, you've got to actually do it as written. So you've got to go sign, it's the operator first, and then 10 like that to give you the answer. <laughs> And that's great if you want to actually, you know, evaluate a big long expression, you're entering it in and, you know, yeah, okay, it's it's fantastic. But just for every everyday day-to-day -day use, I prefer the old-fashioned method. Oh, VPAM, bloody hell. And forgive me for shooting on this angle, but it's just easier to get a display up and view the uh, keyboard at the same time. Now, if you wanted to graph something, it literally was as easy as this. Graph sign for example and bingo it'd draw your sine wave look at that uh, these were just the building functions of course you could do uh, user uh, defined functions but yeah look we can just go whoops we can just go graph say 10 to the x look at that here it goes it's going up and up up and up and up and then you could do stuff like use the uh, trace mode here and then you can just cycle through. You probably can't see it, but there's a tiny little dot somewhere or inverse dot somewhere on that waveform. You can scroll it across and you can actually get 
the uh, value off the graph. One of the main disadvantages for your user-defined functions, it wouldn't auto-scale the graph uh, for you, so you had to go into the range mode here and then actually enter in your uh, uh, ranges manually of your graph. But, you know, apart from that, hey, pretty useful. And this was groundbreaking when it first came out. Oh, you graph your own functions? Unbelievable. I guess the one saving grace of this interface is that you could actually use the engineering mode, for example. We can go up minus three, for example, like that. And then we can actually take the calculated result and then we can cycle through it like that in the engineering mode. So yeah, that was okay. But then, like, you know, you couldn't just suddenly take that result and then just invert that. You had to do that and then press XC. It was like, eh, for your average one-off day-to-day calculations, that's just annoying. Too many button presses. And you also send in one of these ideal voltage uh, detection sticks. Everyone should have one of these. I've got a fluke one. I've also done a teardown of this one. But he says, this one uses a different board to the one I tore down. So let me crack this sucker open and uh, see if we can't have a quick squiz at that. There we go. I can't remember. I haven't uh, watched the previous video. I can't remember, but that's supposed to be a different board and chip to the one I tore down previously. <laughs> so thank you very much, Damien. This is just awesome. I love calculators. And this one is a classic. I always got it wanted one and this is going straight to the pool room next up we have one from you guessed it deutschland germany <laughs> we always get one from germany i have a huge contingent of german viewers i'm big in germany for some reason so hi to all my german viewers thank you very much and uh this one is from um f schleck sorry can't pronounce it at all in uh Orienburg in uh, Germany? I Sorry, I can't pronounce. I'm hopeless at pronunciations. But anyway, let's whip this one open and let's have a look what you've sent. So thank you very much, F. I presume that's your uh, first name. Frank! Good on you, Frank. Here we go. We have a letter from Frank. Um, I have the Metriwatt Unigore A43 is crusty. Uh, yes, in a previous mailbag we looked at the... Uh, there it is. Ta da The Unigor A43 there. We did that in a previous uh, teardown and mailbag. This is an Omida. It's produced in the former German Democratic Republic of East Germany in 1989. <laughs> Let's have a look. We have our... So oh, oh. Oh, good. <laughs> look at that classic. Yeah, I'm going to walk around. Look, I'm going to be uh, all modern and trendy with my uh, leather multimeter pouch. Look at that. Oh, just whip it out. Here we go. Just gonna whip out my ometer, except for the fact that I can't get it out and I don't need to because it opens. Oh, whatever smell that is, it opens like that. Look at that. Beauty. There you go, and it uses a, what's this, 2R10 battery, never heard of it. Um, anyway, the German Democratic Republic, East Germany, 1989. <gasps> oh my goodness, look at that. Oh, <laughs> that is crusty as, oh my goodness, does anyone remember using one? I mean, you know, 1989 is pretty bloody recent, and it's just an ometer. That's it. Nothing else, not even a multi, you can't even call this one a multimeter because a multimeter measures multiple things. Usually, you know, VOM, volt ohmmeter. You know, at least it measures volts and ohms and uh, ohms only. Goodness. Actually, you take it out of the box and it is rather cute. Look at that. <laughs> it's, <laughs> I rather like that. It's got the binding posts and the banana plugs on top, no holes in it to uh, feed your wires through, but uh, that is that is really quite cute. Look, beautiful. Oh, look at that back on it. You can see through it. <gasps> We've got to crack this open. Not that there's going to be much in it. Look at the bizarre range selection switch here. It's just got dots. I mean, you think they, they put the dots on there, They think, and then they've got the dots associated on the display. You think they could have printed them in there, but maybe they've got different models with different... Uh, 
maximum scales or something like that. Anyway, uh, down there is times 0.1 of the scale. So that'd be from like, that'd be like 10 ohms there um, instead of 100. And over here, it'd be times one. So that'd be 100 ohms there and uh, times 10 all the way over here so that'd be 1k 2k there's no even on off button on this thing you just you know have it switch to the range and it only works when you actually do the probe the i can't even zero that thing properly so uh, there's something wrong it's completely cactus and there's the battery holder down in there uh, half of that uh, 2r10 battery whatever the hell a 2r10 battery is but yeah look at that anyway four screws in we go. So there's a look inside the movement. And by the way, the uh, this on the back here, on the bottom, I mean, would be the uh, zero ohms adjust, of course. And uh, but yeah, that. Oh, oh, oh no, there we go. We managed to we managed to bring it back out. We can actually center that. We can actually. Z Adjust that right to infinity. There we go. Woohoo! She's back in action. And of course, then we use the uh, zero ohms adjust on there. So if we can hook up a battery to it, this puppy might still work. And I powered it up here. And well, I can get it to deflect, but uh, basically, I can't get the uh, zeroed ohm function to work at all. And well, it's nowhere near it. And it just doesn't seem to really work. So. Wah, fail. And it's not really worth taking apart any further. Take that plate off. I mean, down in there, there's a couple of resistors and basically are uh, bugger all else. But that's that's pretty much what you'd expect out of an ohmmeter like this. I mean, you know, we've got our so the big magnet in there, which uh, sits around our coil, our deflection coil. And, uh, well, you know, it's about it. It's got a trimmer down here and, well, not much at all. And the original manual. Look at this. <laughs> there we go. For those who can read it, I'm sure a good, uh, probably one third of a quarter of my audience can anyway. And uh, fantastic. There you go. That's who makes it. VEB. I uh, won't even try and pronounce that. But <laughs> There you go, in uh, Linenstrabi, in, oh, no, that's street, sorry, Linenstrabi 244, 244 Linenstrabi is a uh, street, is it not? And uh, there we go, we have some specs, <laughs> couple, if there's no schematic in it, ripped off, and there it is, 5th of March 1989, I guess there was still a call for this thing in 89, go figure, tested by number 3, I think what uh, proof uh, means, I'm assuming. Um, so there you go. Thank you very much, Frank. That is, uh, I wouldn't say crusty, um, but um, minimalist um, would be probably a term I would use, but it's kind of cute. I mean, it's got a, it's got a nice case on it. It's really quite rugged. I'm sure it could survive a fair bit of abuse, actually, and probably has because, well, it's, it seems to be non-functional, but there you go. Ah. Uh, thing of beauty joy forever and this one looks like it's from anonymous but look it does have my picture on it woohoo look at that fantastic all right any resemblance <laughs> great anyway thank you anonymous person uh, local of course if you don't know the australia post uh, bubble wraps um uh, from mount annan local post office that's here in not too far from here, and uh, way, hello. Oh, there we go. Dymo, we have a letter. Greetings, Dave. And it's from Mike. I've included for your teardown of fault finding pleasure an old Sharp ZQ 5200 electronic organizer. Yes, a whopping 64K of memory. Um, he received this from his father as a child when he was working as an electronics engineer at Sharp in Huntingwood. Yes, Huntingwood is just here in Sydney, just down the Great Western Highway there, out west, uh, back in the 80s and 90s. I wonder if they're still there. I haven't driven past there in years, but there used to be a huge Sharp factory. Uh, on the Great Western Highway out in Western Sydney here. Jeez, I started work in 1989. How young are you, Mike? 
Jeez, if your dad worked there in the 80s and 90s. Um, there you go. It's certainly seen better days. Well, yes, it has. Look at that. I used one of these. It was a small, much smaller, thinner one. It was even thinner than half that. Maybe, yeah, it was like a third of the thickness of this thing. And it was a, I think it was 32 or 64. Um, but I didn't get this one because I wanted something really uh, slim line. And uh, yeah, I remember these things and I actually used it back in the day. I had, uh, you know, I used it as an address book and stuff like that. I had people's uh, contact details and phone numbers back then before the days of mobile phones, of course. You know, you'd have these things and you keep diary appointments for my very hectic social life. <coughs> as a nerd, yeah right, and uh, yeah, these were um, quite useful back in the day, and uh, they, I never lost any info from it, they always had a, a primary battery and a second uh, battery backup uh, battery, but uh, you could, and then a super cap on top of that, there we go, it's still in there, C23, two, three, uh, two, three. Oh, goodness, I'll get it right eventually, CR2032 batteries. And uh, normal operation, yeah, this one had the mode switch where you had to actually uh, put it if you're certain location if you wanted to replace the sucker. And these battery replacement mechanisms were, were actually work quite well. In normal operation, look, with the tab switch there, you couldn't physically slide this across like that to remove these batteries here. If you want to replace the, and if you wanted to get, and this one, uh, the, so this, these are the operational batteries, this is the battery backup one here, you couldn't physically slide that. So none of them could fall out, you couldn't replace them. If you wanted to replace the backup battery, you had to move that over there, and then you could slide that out, you still couldn't get these out. If you wanted to replace the main batteries, you slide that down, and bingo, you can pop the batteries out. It's a neat system, idiot proof, so that your muggles operating these damn things can't, uh, screw it up and lose all their contents and of course because these were kept in uh, SRAM back in the day they weren't uh, you know kept in flash or anything like that all right I've replaced the batteries let's see if this sucker works no it's a it's a fail might have to is there a reset switch on this sucker no it doesn't even work after pressing the reset switch it's cactus all right so let's open this I've taken off the uh, peeled off the back cover it literally just peeled off it was just stuck on the instructions there and uh, of course this thing is uh, it's not going to be much in here there's going to be a basically a single chip solution pretty much plus my uh, external memory there will be an external 64 or dual 32k SRAM and uh, kilobytes that is and that's probably uh, all she wrote, look at that, we've got some, I don't know, do I have to peel that one off too? Probably a couple of screws under there. Yes, uh, Sharp pretty much owned the organizer business back in the day. I'm not sure when the glory days of the organizer started and ended. If anyone knows, it's probably on Wikipedia. Uh, but if anyone knows, that'd be uh, interesting to find out. Ah, oh, I think I've got another bloody screw up under here maybe I could just uh, break that sucker but uh, yeah sharp were pretty much uh, number one the sharp organizers flooded the market they had so many different models and I uh, I, I really liked the uh, user interface on them I thought it was uh, really quite good and uh, there we go yeah quad flat packs and uh, memory ROM single chip solution chip on board job there doing something so let's end uh, that's our expansion interface over there that uh, Mike was talking about the serial uh, expansion or some other expansion interface right on the end like that and uh, yeah it's about all she wrote there's our 32 kilohertz crystal now check this out what I at first glance I thought this chip on board device here was actually uh, you know, mounted on the main board, but it's not. It's on a secondary board here, and then that board is surface mount soldered onto here, almost like it's, I don't know, not really an afterthought, but gee, I don't know. And then the um, 32.768 kilohertz watch crystal is then just, uh, you know, tacked onto a couple of the pins 
of that chip here. So that's got to be more than the, just the real-time clock chip. And it seems to have went to a lot of trouble for a real-time clock chip. I mean, this is not hugely old, this thing. So anyway, we've got ourselves, yeah, there we go, uh, 27C256. Uh, They're our ROMs, actually. So that's our firmware. And uh, there's our SRAM up there. And really, there's not much else to it. Here's one of the expansion ports on the side here. And uh, that's just a serial uh, expansion port. Couple of, look, they've got an insulated pad under there and they've gunked down a couple of these chokes here. Not sure why they've done that. They've bodged on a cap here. Look, and they've attention to detail. <laughs> they've actually put, I <laughs> don't know why they've bothered, but they have. They've put a, uh, some heat shrink tubing over one side of that. And there's the other uh, expansion port underneath there. But as you can see, there's bugger all inside these things. I mean, there's, you know, <laughs> there's naff all in them. And it's all in the uh, firmware. And of course, all the LCD uh, driving stuff is all going to be up in here. So that'll be, you know, the big dock matrix uh, display that's going to have um, its own. So maybe we can uh, crack that open and uh, just very quickly and have a look at the uh, LCD drivers up there. Nothing exciting, though. Well, that's interesting. I expected uh, another PCB in there, maybe with some quad flat packs. Uh, driving that board and a uh, zebra strip or something going in there but we have some uh, you know a, a chip on flex here and uh, some hot bar stuff going on there and uh, there we go well we've got another one there we go and so they're on uh, on the flex membrane and that's pretty much it and of course this would be a sharp LCD because sharp were I think uh, still are huge in uh, LCDs so there you go they really know how to manufacture LCDs sharp and they would have uh, been able to churn those out for pennies and that's you know it's quite advanced manufacturing which uh, you know goes into getting uh, those sort of things right so that is about all she wrote then we've got a keypad uh, going down there and not much else so there you go it's a bit of a mess but thank you very much mike for uh, sending that one in these were these pocket organizers were huge so if you do know the uh life span of these things when they actually you know died and how quickly they die i think they did die a pretty quick uh, death in the end but i i certainly had a sharp one and uh, i've probably still got it somewhere and it probably still works probably still got the original backup battery in there because these s rams are ridiculous you know it's ba ridiculously low currents basically the shelf life of the battery in these things and yeah they were great back in the day and lucky last for today yes i still got two four five left so i'll leave those for next mailbag monday which hopefully should be next week I can't do 10 in one episode it gets pretty ridiculous oh this one's from uh, aiden senior once again aussie um envelope he's from uh, stockton once again in new south wales so thank you very much aiden what do we have oh another bloody mobile phone you know how many bloody mobile phones I've got? Oh, unbelievable. This is tiny though. The little Motorola thing. Man, they don't make them this small anymore. And, well, yeah, I can see why. Jeez, you could almost swallow that thing. Unbelievable. And what else have we got? It's a universal dimmer. Why? There's a note. Hi Dave, I thought this Clipsal speed controller dimmer would make an interesting mini teardown. I find them quite fascinating considering their size and the fact that it can drive 450 watts. Yeah, there's probably going to be very little, uh, well there has to be by their nature, uh, very little loss in there. Uh, they have to be quite efficient. Um, just, you know, the sheer numbers. You can't uh, drive 450 watts and be 90% efficient because if you're 90% efficient, you're dropping, you know, 45 watts in this thing. Eh, not possible. So they're incredibly efficient. Uh, this particular one was uh, scratchy. I keep, love the blog, keep up the good work. I watch your episodes with frequency until it mega hurts. Wah, 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 wah. Thanks, Aiden. Yeah, I've never uh, used one of these before, and I don't uh, particularly know what's in them, but there is a board. Look at the bottom. I mean, this one has a uh, has a nice big pot on the back. That's what he said was uh, scratchy, and uh, there's a fair bit of surface mount integration in that sucker. Let's crack it open. Wow, these little puppies are chock-a-block. Look at this. I mean, we've got... Looks like we're going to have double-sided load on... Look at this little cube construction board so three boards we're going to have probably double-sided 
load on it. There's a lot going on in there. And that's actually fairly common to uh, butt boards together in this configuration like that, right angle boards. I've done that a few times myself, especially inside uh, slots. You can actually cut out slots inside a board and then mount it right angles like that and have the solder on uh, both sides. And you can actually get a pretty good uh, right angle board out of a main, just sticking out of a main board there. So they've got just the one tab on here, so we're going to have to desolder that. And I'm trying to prise this thing open, and these bastards are soldered shut. Unbelievable. What a turd. Well, there ain't nothing you can't fix with a drill. Here we go. Woohoo! We're in. So there you go. That's what's inside one of these puppies. And uh, there's our pot still on there. I just cut the uh, pins off the top of that to get one of the boards out and these two boards here of course they were soldered together like that I had to get my solder sucker and suck out all those pins before I could even get that board out and um, yeah so they're actually double sided pretty densely populated uh, double sided load there lots of little uh, 6 pin SOT23 packages I don't know why they need to go to all that trouble anyway here we go here's the uh, Here's where we get all of our uh, switching and efficiency from. We've got two MOSFETs here. They were riveted into the sides here. There you go. They've got some pop rivets there. So I had to drill those out. And uh, let's take a look at that top board once again. Double-sided load. Not surprising. Here's our mains input. Here we've got our four uh, bridge rectifier diodes, so they're forming a bridge rectifier, no doubt. Uh, that's not surprising. And then we've got a cap on top of theirs and of course that cap is a quality uh, reefer brand one there so you know no drama there whatsoever you'd expect these to be high quality of course and then there's an e3f uh 250 volt rated 115 degree c thermal cutout that's from microtherm they make a uh, nice little thermal cutout devices so basically if in the inside of here i mean it's not thermally bonded over here but basically if the inside of that uh the case pretty much gets to 115 degrees C, then it's just going to get, just going to cut the mains off completely. So, little safety feature. And no surprises for guessing. We've got some MOSFETs in there. Standard, pretty standard ones. 20N60C3. Well, standard for this sort of uh, application that requires the uh, massively high efficiency. Because you know that's not much of a heatsink there. So you really, you know, these things have to be incredibly efficient. Um, as we said before, 450 watts. So you know you can only uh, even at uh, one percent. You know, 99% efficiency, that's still four and a half watts inside that tiny little beast there. So let's go to the data sheet. And no surprises for guessing that you get sort of, you know, the world's best RDS on, uh, which is the on resistance when the MOSFET is switched on in a TO220 package, the world's best one. Don't know if that claim is actually true, but RDS um, on 0.19 ohms there, uh, 650 volt VDS rated, 20 amps. These things are a beast, and I'm not, they're probably not cheap either. I don't know what the DigiKey price is, but yeah, these puppies wouldn't be extreme DV. DDT rated, oh, periodic avalanche rated, oh, beautiful, look at the specs. So thank you very much Aiden, that's a rather little interesting mini teardown as you suspected it would be. These things are chock-a-block, I can't believe how much, uh, you know, why they need all of that. Gee, I don't know, but uh, if anyone has a schematic for one of these puppies, it'd be really interesting. I mean, we're not going to get part numbers off these uh, really, you know, easily obtainable part numbers off these little 6-pin uh, SOT23s and stuff like that. So if anyone does have a schematic for one of these puppies, uh, please link it in. Let us know. So there you go. This has actually been a very lengthy Mailbag Monday, even though I only opened a half my stuff. Anyway, please let me know about the new format with, uh, you know, the talking headshot uh, on camera if it's any good and if you like that. I've, I'm actually shooting this with uh, two different cameras here, by the way. There it is. So I've got my, uh, <laughs> got my uh, B-roll camera. That one was the one I was uh, shooting the material with. And there's my uh, Rode video mic, uh, shotgun video mic pro. And uh, I just sit there and it actually works pretty well. I just, you know, as soon as I'm done shooting something here, I come over to this bench, which has my uh, uh, Canon HF uh, G10, my main uh, camera, and I shoot all the stuff on the bench, as I normally would. So, 
let me know if that's any good. If you want to discuss it, jump on over to the EEV blog forum. And as always, if you like Mailbag Monday, please give it a big thumbs up. Catch you next time.